Happy Sabbath, Church. Today we are going to speak about the sanctuary. And the reason is because it is important to understand the sanctuary because it is repeated in Daniel and Revelation. What is so interesting about the sanctuary is that God is showing us what's happening and he is using the sanctuary to lead us through it until we have to meet him where he wants to meet us. Now, before we start, we know that there was war in heaven and the devil, Satan, the dragon, he fought against Michael and Michael fought against the dragon. And to know exactly, let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and see what it says. And in verse 7, chapter 12 of Revelation, and it says this, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. Now, for you to know who Satan is, we need to find out exactly what happened before he was cast out. So, and today we're going to be flipping pages. So, open your Bible again to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, and from verse 12. And he says this, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt, exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit upon, also upon the mount of the congregation in the south of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So Satan wanted to be like God, to actually overthrow God's sovereignty. And to do this, we have to get into a war. And this is why in chapter 12 of Revelation, he says that Lucifer, the dragon, the serpent of old, fought against Michael, which is Jesus, now that they fought, let's see what God says to Satan afterwards. Chapter 28 of Ezekiel, in verse, from verse 12, God is talking to Ezekiel. But we know that this is not basically the king of Tyrus because it has a deeper meaning into it. Let's see from verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, Thou sealest up the psalm full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of, of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, and emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy trab tablets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have said thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the, fiery sto of the, of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that was created, Still iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, 
and I will destroy the O cover and cherub from the midst of the stones of fire. And in verse 18, he says, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. So if Satan defiled his sanctuaries, does that mean Satan knows what the sanctuary is? Yes. And when God gave Moses the command to build a sanctuary, I can see Satan looking and remembering what he saw in heaven. Let's go to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25. We will see that God is telling Moses to build a sanctuary. And in verse 1, he says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, he shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair, a ram skin dyed red, and badger skin, and shitting wood, wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the effort and in the breastplate. And, verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God is saying to make a sanctuary or actually unto Moses, he was saying, to make a sanctuary so he can dwell among them. So how important is the sanctuary? It is important, because without the sanctuary, God cannot dwell among us. Now, in the time of Moses, that was a literal sanctuary. They had to build an altar of sacrifice and a labor and ark of the covenant. But now, in a spiritual war that we are in, we are supposed to build God, our body, to be a sanctuary for God. Because God wants to dwell in our hearts, in our mind. So it's no longer a literal sanctuary, but a spiritual sanctuary. And when you get to that point of the sanctuary, you will see where God says to go next. But first, let's look at the writing of the prophet Ellen White and see what she says about the sanctuary and how important it is for us today. And he says this, Review and Herald, November 27, 1883. In his word, yellow words, in his words, God has revealed saying truth, saving truth. As a people, we should be earnest students of prophecy. We should not rest until we become intelligent in regard to the subject of the sanctuary, which is brought out in the visions of Daniel and John. Daniel is a prophetic book, apocalyptic book, and John is also an apocalyptic book, and they are both prophecy. And we read in chapter 12 of Revelation about Satan making war in heaven. And the sanctuary is again shown there. This, show, this subject sheds great light on our, pres our present position and work and gives us unmistakable proof that God had, has led us in our past experience. And she goes on and say about the great disappointment in 1844. It says this, it explains our disappointment in 1844 showing us that the sanctuary to be cleansed was not the earth as we had supposed, but that Christ then entered into the most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary and is there performing the closing work of his priestly office in fulfillment of the words of the angel to the prophet Daniel. Unto 2,300 days then the shall be then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And again, we see the sanctuary in Daniel again. So how important is the sanctuary? It is very important. Now that we have 
made a sanctuary, the first step God is saying to us is to go to meet him at the altar of sacrifice. Let's, take, let's turn your Bible to Exodus chapter 12 and see what the altar of sacrifice is. In chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 8, actually let's start from verse 7. And before that, God had already told them to get a lamb, a ewe, without blemish, and to kill it. It's a male of the first year of the sheep or the goat without blemish. And from verse 7, it says, chapter 12 of Exodus, it says this, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat. So the first thing they have to do is to kill the lamb, a male lamb or goat, and take the blood and put it on the lentils of the door. And there's a purpose for that. And they shall eat the flesh, verse 8, in that night, both with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So let's pause right here. So they need to take the blood and put it on the lentils. Why? How can, do you, what do you need to get the blood and put it on the lentil? And this is what we call in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith. You need faith because blood cannot save you, but by faith, they took the blood and put it on the lentils. Yes. And they were to eat the flesh roasted in fire with bitter herbs. Now what is the bitter herbs? What is bitter herb? What does it mean to be in bitter experience? Let's go to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, and let's read in verse 10. And he says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So the bitter herb is, not on, is none other than the experience of true repentance, the mourning and supplication. Because the lamb that was slain is a type or an antitype of Jesus Christ being the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Whom he, they have pierced, that is Jesus Christ. Have I get the bitter herb experience? Have you? They had to kill a lamb, get the blood, put on a lentil, and eat it with roasted in fire with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. That is called the supplication. It is not eat not of it raw, not sudden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head and his leg, and with the pertinence thereof. And he shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Have we already gone through the altar of sacrifice? 
Let's see what the prophet says about the altar of sacrifice. He says this, GC, page 18 and 19. He, the son, of, the son of God, the promised one of Israel, whose power had conquered death and caught his captive from the grave, was in tears, not of ordinary grief, but of intense, irrepressible agony. His tears were not for himself, though he well knew whither his feet were tending. Before him lay Gethsemane, the scene of his approaching agony. The sheep gate also was in sight, through which for centuries the victim of suck for sacrifice had been led, and which was to open for him when, him, when he should be brought as a lamb to the slaughter. So Jesus Christ, going up to approaching Calvary, for centuries they have been killing lambs, which led to Jesus' death on the cross. That's what it is. Upon the path which Christ was soon to tread, must fall the horror and of great darkness as it should make his soul an offering for sin. And now we are studying the altar of sacrifice. So the killing of the lamb is none other than Jesus Christ being the ultimate sacrifice, ultimate lamb of God slain for the world. E.G. White Testimony to the Church, Volume 5, page 307, paragraph 1. And it says this, I have seen a device representing a bullock standing between a plow and an altar with the inscription, ready for either, willing to swelter in the weary fuel, furrow, or to bleed on the altar of sacrifice. This is the position the child of God should ever be in willing to go where duty calls, to deny self, and to sacrifice for the cause of truth. The Christian church was founded, was founded upon the principle of sacrifice. If any man will come after me, says Christ, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follows, follows me. He requires the whole heart, the entire affection. The altar of sacrifice is the first step after you made the sanctuary because the one thing that we're supposed to be willing to do is to go where duty calls. Which means you have to deny yourself and take up your cross daily. You can say to God, no, I don't want to go somewhere because it's dangerous. Then you haven't surrendered yourself to God. Jesus had two choices, and he chose the one that is what God's purpose was. He denied himself, and he took his cross daily. And it was the ultimate sacrifice. So what is the application today? We are not to go and make a sanctuary, to build a building as a sanctuary and have an altar of sacrifice or labor, no. We are no longer in a literal physical war, but a spiritual war. A spiritual war meaning that what we need to do that was in the time of ancient Israel, Israel is now in a spiritual Israel. We need to surrender our life to God, repent from our sin, and accept God's forgiveness. We don't need to go and kill a lamb anymore because Jesus already paid the price on the cross. Now, I want to know if there is something that is present truth, right? Present truth. Do we have any present truth now? Let's see. Is, is it costly to be in a relationship with God? Catholic headline, Catholic Herald, to live as God's children, we must sacrifice something of our past. One thing is, we know for sure, 
we are not to sacrifice one something. It's everything because God requires the whole heart, not partially, everything. If we want to be called children of God, we need to surrender our entire life unto God. Not some part, not what we don't like. Everything is to be given to God. Now, something happened earlier, which is really interesting that dangerous. How is it dangerous? Well, let's see what it says. National Catholic Reporter headlines. Church is essential for faith. There are no free agents, Pope says. Let's see what is dangerous. He says, let's keep on down. He says that every Christian, he said, can trace his or her faith back to parents, grandparents, teachers, and friends, or friends. First of all, our faith comes from God, not from our parents, nor grandparents, nor anybody else than from God. And he says, I always remember the nun, I always remember the nun who taught me catechism. I know she's in heaven because she was a holy woman. Second of all, nobody is, is in heaven when they die. They go to the, to the dust where they came from and their spirit go back, goes back to God who gave it. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 7. In the Old Testament, the Pope said, God called Abraham and began to form a people that would become a blessing to the world with great patience and all that he prepared the people. Now let's go down, let's keep on down to the last paragraph. Pope Francis described as dangerous, dangerous, the temptation to believe that one can have a personal, direct, immediate relationship with Jesus Christ without communion with and the meaning of the church. It is good to go to church to fellowship with brothers and sisters, but I do not need to go to the church to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. No, I do not, because I can just go to Jesus as I am. Is it dangerous for you to do that? No, it is not dangerous. Let's see what, what else he says. Something really interesting. At the end of his talk, last part, the bottom paragraph, he says, at the, end of it, at the end of his talk, the Pope asked people to join him in praying that they would never give in to the temptation of thinking you can do without others, without the church, that you can save yourself of thinking you can be a laboratory with Christians. First of all, salvation is by faith. And, it's, and to be saved, you must have a personal, immediate relationship with Jesus Christ. The surrender. Yes, you have brothers and sisters to strengthen you in faith, but you do not need people to be saved because what you need is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you are, you, you are not a laboratory Christian. If you think you are, then I'm not sure exactly what you are. But as long as you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you can be saved or you will be saved. So, is church essential for faith? You can say church is good because God put the church so we can evangelize. But don't think if you go to the church, you will be saved. Because he says this, let church members bear in mind that the fact that their names are registered on the church book will not save them. So because your name is in a church book, that does not mean you will be saved. It does not mean that. 
So how would you do this now? Would you consider being a person ready to go where duty calls? Or be different and not repent, not give your life to Christ? Because Jesus Christ, he gave himself to his father. And he became the ultimate sacrifice. The Israelites, they were to kill a lamb, take the blood, put it on the lentil, and eat the flesh roasted in fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. In our time, we are to build God a sanctuary, which is our body, because God wants to be dwelling in our hearts and minds. And then he will say, next, meet me at the altar of sacrifice. And there you will learn to give up yourself. The denying of self, the repentance, the bitter experience, which is the mourning and supplication. Yes. So I encourage everyone to live a life of denial, always ask God to help you because we are weak when it comes to Satan. But by God's grace, if we ask God to help us deny ourselves to his cause, we can overcome every temptation. Repentance is the first step once you have built the altar of sac once you have built the sanctuary, which is you, because your body is a temple. You are the temple of the living God. Once God is dwelling in you, he wants to meet you at the altar of sacrifice, and there we will start the journey. Repentance is the first step. And next, you will learn where God is leading you once you have gone through the altar of sacrifice. I hope that everyone gives their hearts to the Lord and deny themselves and repent and use their body as a sanctuary. This is my prayer for you and for me. God bless.